I love the vote of confidence there. I did, uh, I was able to get online uh, with the, dang, encoding overload. Consider turning down video settings or using a faster encoding preset. Hmm. Oh, the things I do. Anyway, I was able to get your grades, so if you are interested in getting them, I'll start with uh, Airman Griffin. Do you want to hear your grade? Or do you? Okay, you got a 91 average. Javier? Uh, where are you on this thing? Looks like a 97. King? 97. Next up, we have price. Do we even have to worry about that? Okay. Uh, Roundsley? Okay. Do you want to know? 89. Spore? 85. Stanick? I can find you. Ah, there you are. Uh, 96. Hall? Do you want yours? 95. Alvarez? 91. Rapoli? Okay, so you don't want it? Okay. Sergeant Kinnon? Uh, 96. Yeah. Did I? I apologize. You want yours? <laughs> wow. The sarcasm already flowing this morning. You want it? 99? This is a, a rarity for me. I get to see grades, average grades, really up there. So I hope that you guys are taking this block seriously because this is really getting crazy. So let me get it over to chat. We are going to cover a lot today. So be prepared. I would like to take a break somewhere in there when I find an opportunity. Go ahead, Sergeant Kennan. Uh, let me uh, do this and do this. So is everybody read? Ready? No? Maybe? <laughs> you guys are really... Yeah, the, the weather's probably got everybody down. All right, so we're going to... Oh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry about it yet. Um, tropical storm. I can't even pronounce the darn name, but, you know, it's uh, slated to come through the middle of Louisiana. That's where the center of everything is going to be, but the, it's going to be a tropical storm maybe a minimal hurricane. Uh, I worry about it when it gets into that uh, you know, August, September time frame. Those are the ones that get really nasty. So I, I we'll probably get a lot of rain from it. I wouldn't worry yet. They'll tell you when to worry. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a Hurricane Katrina survivor. I was in my house when it was blowing apart that was not fun. So, anyway, that's my history and I'm sticking to it. No. What do you get? Dust storms? Floods? Yeah, you guys get a lot of rain. I don't envy that. 
I'm more of a, a mountain person. Not the Rockies, but the Appalachia. All right, so let's start without further ado and get as much as we can done today. Uh, we'll have the same time frames on today's Wednesday, Thursday. I'm hoping to be mostly finished by Thursday morning, but we're going to have homework, I'm hoping, Thursday afternoon. So please get your, go ahead. Sure. Correct. Well, I am not allowed to discuss the test stuff, but I can tell you this much. It's a pretty good study tool. But it, yeah. Yes, yes, that is correct. So my suggestion is if you're going to take this appraisal, do it with just your TOs, not your study guide workbook. Okay, but if you feel uncomfortable, you know, go ahead and use your study guide workbook. But bottom line is, is try to do it without the tools that you're, you know, without the study guide workbook because you're not going to have that in a test. So try it without that. You can use the tech orders because that will be with your test. You have the NSM, you'll have the JERK 239, and you'll have the C's and D's with you. You'll also have all of that electronic. So it's, it's not a big deal, so use the tools that are given to you. Okay. <laughs> I, I perfectly understand that. I like to go over the homework. And then, like, that Friday, I'm hoping, you know, because you guys got, oh, geez, uh, refresh my memory. I think we got, you, right. So I would like to try to go over the appraisals Friday so it gives you all the tools for the weekend to study. So that that's yeah, that's the scoop. That's the way I like to do things. It seems to work out and so far so good. We haven't had as many failures now that we're doing this. It just takes us some time both the students and the instructors to figure out this teleworking and you know, trying to get everybody on the same page and make it happen where you had the best opportunity to pass and with a, a good score. So. Uh, yeah, I, I did that once with eight and I was pretty much saturated, I think with a class of 12. I probably will want to go over them. And if anybody has any questions during that, that's when you'll get your answers for the appraisals. And then we can go through, if you missed it, let's explain why you missed it. That is correct, sir. That, that make it easy. I, I try to make it easy on you, and I try, you know, after learning my lesson the hard way with the uh, grading of the appraisals, I also graded the homework, and it was probably about four or five hours worth of work. The one thing I did for the appraisals is I was doing a compilation of trying to see where I need to focus on when I went over the appraisals because it was about a two-hour session when we went over them. Any other? Okay. Yeah. That's that's fine. Not a problem. Anybody else have any other questions? If not, you know, I'm available anytime, any day. Last night I was up about 8.30 helping out Miss Irwin. So, <laughs> and this morning... Six, answering questions. So it, it's one of those things. 
All right, so we're going to look at starting with three alpha, identify basic facts about principles, capabilities, limitations, and satellite transmit and receive systems. So without further ado, you can see that we have the AFC application. Bottom line is you're probably going to touch some piece of equipment that is satellite base. You have, or what we're going over today with 3 Alpha is the basic radio picture, fundamental radio parameters, radio performance assessment, ancillary functions. Now, we're doing a quick review. You'll notice that this is the back of the NSM case. You'll notice down here in the corner where it says case D, bottom right hand corner. What the heck? You don't even see my cursor in there. Wow. Okay. Uh, case D, you guys were working with case A, alpha. Now, why is it it had case D on it? Well, they're, normally with the TSC, there's like two sets of everything. Case D is the second set. You're going to see that in room 118 and 120. And as you can see, they're all highlighted. And there is no lights on the back of this thing. A lot of people get confused when asked, well, where are the lights? And it's like, well, they're all on the front panel. You can see that we have six CDIs, six T1E1s, 12 NRZs, and two HISIs. Does everybody have this worksheet? If not, don't worry about it. If you do, uh, this is going to be a great place to fill in the information on there. This is a basic radio picture when it comes to satellite or wideband. The first thing we look at is transmit. Transmit seems to be the way the electronics wants to work because it usually, when you have a transceiver, it normally has bits and pieces of the other devices that go along with it. So with transmit, we talk about a very simplistic objective, which is called transmit baseband to the dis distant end. It's accomplished in three steps. You have modulation, up conversion, and amplification. Seems pretty easy. So we look at the modulator. We're going to take what's called the baseband. Now this is a probably first time you've heard of the word baseband in quite some time if you hadn't dealt with computers way back in the day. We always talk about baseband. Uh, with baseband it is a aggregate signal that's coming down the, to be modulated in the radio. So the modulator is going to convert it to baseband. Now depending on what piece of equipment you have, it could be anywhere from 70 to 700 megahertz. I disagree with this statement because when you look at the Jerk 239, better known as the Tisser, you're going to hear those two words interchanged. It's transmit IF is in the 7.2 to 7.625 gigahertz. Yeah, it's up that high. And, and I'll show you when we get to the C's and D's as to why that is. So next up we have the up converter. It's going to convert that IF because that's what it is. You modulate it to the IF, then IF gets conver up, converted to the RF. And you'll notice it says it uses a local oscillator. Why? Because you need to get that signal boosted to that particular level. Next up, we're going to do a high-powered amplifier to ensure that we get the necessary power to the distant end. Because as you well know, when you went through block four, you have what path loss and everything else that's involved with that. So that's the reason why we boost the power to shoot it to the distant end. When we reverse everything, it's called recover the baseband. So now we're in receive. So we went from transmit to receive. Recover the baseband. So you sent the baseband out, transmit baseband to the distant end. Now you're going to get it back in. Three steps. Basically, it's the reverse of transmit. You're going to recover the signal little bit of amplification in there. 
then you're going to down convert it and then you're going to demodulate it into the baseband. So let's take a look at the first one. Low noise amplifier, LNAs. This one's going to take the signal, amplify it, clean it up a little bit and send it to the down converter. The down converter is going to convert it from that RF received frequency to an IF. Now this IF is 70 megahertz by the way when we look at the JERK 239. We also use a local oscillator to convert it. Next up we have a demodulator which gets it to the baseband and it goes to the multiplexer. So everything that you see from when we talk baseband is coming from the multiplexer. And if you do have that sheet, there's the answers. I'll pause for a minute if you want to write them down. Okay, I'm just making sure. So everybody has this particular slide and I can go on? Anybody not, let me go that route. Okay, good. Now, we have something that is breaking it down just a little bit further. You can see we have a modulator that's that circle with the X. Then you'll notice we have an up converter another X with the circle, but you'll notice that there's a sine wave in this particular area here. Uh, with that in mind, that is your local oscillator within the radio, and it's generating a frequency to up convert to the RF or down convert the RF to IF. So up convert IF to RF, down convert RF to IF. So it's basically the reverse. Next up, we're going to talk about something called a branch assembly. In this particular assembly, there is no power provided in any one of these particular items. We have a, a description of what happens in the branch assembly directs microwave energy to and from the antenna, suppresses unwanted harmonics and external noise, aids in receiver selectivity, permits the monitoring of the output power. Now we're going to go through this, what we just looked at in the branch assembly when we get to the C's and D's in the JERK 239. The first one we're going to look at is that arrow with a circle. Now if you look at the branch assembly, we're looking at this device right here. What does it do? It's an isolator. The whole idea is to separate, in this case, to transmit to the antenna. We don't want any of that reflected power coming back into our powered output. And that's to prevent, if, it, if we did let that go through the reflected power, it would literally burn up the finals it's what we call the finals, the power amplifiers that are, that are taking that RF and boosting it to the operating or the operating wattage is what it would be. It does provide some impedance matching and when we have different mediums it does adjust appropriately. We have something called a directional coupler. This one is Realistically, you guys have already had some access to this. They may have called it something different. But in block one, do you guys work with the digital watt meter? Old school 43 in your block one. It, it's a three line. It's a digital three line. Well, you notice that there were two... Uh, RF diodes that you could turn in those little, well, I guess you could call them filters or, geez, they pop out is what they do. And you can interchange them, change the frequencies on those two little dials that's right above the selections for your times 10, times 1, and 2.5, 10, and I can't remember the other one. But those are basically directional couplers. What it's doing is it's measuring forward power and measuring 
reflected power. That's what these things do. They are nothing more than RF diodes that take the uh, I'm trying to think of the, the power that is being generated off of a single line because of the current that's radiated out of that line it bleeds over onto these diodes and they can see if it's board power or reflected power and we use that for monitoring same with all the, you know like the prick 113 the uh, prick 150s now you your prick 113 has a device in there that when it reaches a 3 to 1 vis wire which is that reflected power coming back it will go from a 10 watt mode to a 2 watt mode. That's what also these directional couplers will do for you. Sometimes it's a safety feature. Next up we have filters. You can read that. Bottom line is, is I only want the frequencies I need and I'm going to block everything else. Next up we have something called a circulator. Now this one you can Google. Kind of crazy. There are two different types. There's a Diplexer and duplexer. We're going to get into that in just a minute. I think I got that in there. I guess I didn't put it in there for some reason. Well, anyway, there is a description to it. I think I may have it in the C's and D's to give you a little bit more breakout on it. But you can Google these. There are differences to it. Now, with the circulator that you see, I think it crosses into the duplexer line. I could be wrong. I got to look at it. But anyway, it's a three-way passive device and it consists of a ferrite core on a couple of those lines and I don't know how it works, but it just works. They were able to engineer it to where you can keep the receive out of the transmit and the transmit out of the receive but use the same doggone antenna. Isn't that ridiculous? But it does it. Next up, we have something called Rago. Rago, receive, better known as RSL, receive signal level. A for AGC voltage, G for gain, and O for output. That's the Rago that they're talking about. That's that acronym. So let's take a look at each one of them. RSL, receive signal level. That is what is happening when the antenna is receiving a signal. It either goes up or goes down. Let me try to give you an analogy of that, why it would go up or go down. In the air, wonderful world of air traffic control, if you did not have this receive signal level and AGC and a couple other things with it, let's pretend the plane is 200 miles out and they've contacted the base. And if you didn't have this AGC and RSL, you would literally have to turn up the volume on your radio to listen to that plane. As the plane get, got closer to the runway, you would have to start turning down the volume. This is that received level. Now, AGC represents that received level in a voltage. And what happens is, is at first, if you have a, in this case, the plane is right there on the runway, your receive level is going to be through the roof, your AGC voltage is going to be through the roof, but your gain, i got to bring it down just so I don't blast you out when I key up. The object behind all of this is to keep your output constant so it's a comfortable listening level. As the plane leaves the runway and keeps going out, the receive signal level starts weakening, in other words, going down. Uh, sorry about that. That receive signal goes down. Well, your gain's going to have to increase, so your output's got to stay the same. And you can see the two lines below it says RSL and AGC are directly proportional, where RSL and gain are inversely. What's the outcome? I want to keep my volume constant. It's like driving in your car and you get closer to a city, your your radio is going to keep that volume at a constant level unless you either turn it up or turn it down. As you start exiting 
this city and going away from it, your receive signal is probably going to get less, but your volume is still going to stay the same until it gets outside of the range of the radio station. So hopefully I've explained that portion a little bit on that when you see RSL on the meters with the tisser. We're going to look at frequency accuracy and stability, bandwidth, frequency response, selectivity, gain, and sensitivity. This, these are all fundamental radio parameters. We have two definitions pretty much in, in, in explaining frequency accuracy and stability along with bandwidth. What we look at is the oscillator. Depending on the oscillator determines how accurate and how stable your frequency is going to be. Nowadays, it's pretty darn good. Back when I was going through, they would drift just a little bit, and you would have to put them back on frequency. Now with software-defined radios, man, they make it so much more easier. Bandwidth? In our case, we're looking at the radio. We're going to look at the upper and lower frequencies, whether it is the range of the radio or if it's the range of what's being transmitted because they are different. For example, you guys have come across something called a 25K hertz spacing. Well, that's how much when, let's just say, the radio is at 300 megahertz, I have 12.5 on the low end and 12.5 on the upper end that I can use for my intelligence. And of course, single sideband's a little bit different. I think that's 2.7 and that can't drift very far. Next up, we have frequency response and selectivity. Again, these are definitions, frequency range over which an audio device or system can produce or reproduce a signal within a certain tolerance. Now, if you've had stereo systems and you looked at the either at the front end or at the back end where it gives you all the specifications of it it'll have frequency response on it next up we have selectivity bottom line is when I want one frequency that's where I got to be I got to be very selective about it I don't want any of the others I just want the one Next up, we have gain and sensitivity. Gain is just like that volume control button on your radio where you turn it up or turn it down, or stereo. You have sensitivity. This one is between, you guys did the signal plus noise to noise ratio in block three. I know you did. I've played with that radio throughout most of my Air Force career. And sensitivity, you literally got to check that, and there has to be, First of all, it is we look at the signal plus the noise, and then we have an oscillator generate the signal to cancel the noise, and we look at the noise. The difference between the signal plus noise and the noise, there's going to be a drop, and it has to be at least 10 dB difference between those two. If not, the radio is not working as advertised. So maybe you might need to get rid of that uh, receiver portion of the uh, PRIC-113, remove and replace. Next up we have something called systems approach. Now this one I'm going to try to explain it to you. Systems approach means that if you have a tisser and you're going to transmit from one end to the other and you know for a fact that that tisser is working just fine with its counterpart but yet you're called out on a job because something is not working. Well, your equipment is a tisser, not the multiplexer, not the computer, but your customer is waiting on you going, hey, fix it. Well, you got to look at the system. You just can't look at the tisser. You got to look at the whole system. So you got to start at the user and work your way down the line. If it just so happens it's a computer, then you're going to have to call the computer people out there and say, hey, listen, uh, here's where I troubleshot. It's not the multiplexer because I get everybody else's. I don't get this one user's problem. So you're going to have to come out and get it. Or it might be the multiplexer. The this and ends multiplexer is working fine, but not the multiplexer. It's tied to the, the tisser that's on your end. 
So the systems approach is you got to look at it from one customer's end to the other customer's end, even though your equipment's in there. So you're going to check your equipment first, and then you're going to have to branch out. So that's what the systems approach means. Next up, we have performance measures. We look at quality, reliability, and speed. Quality is how close it resembles the input. Reliability is how much time the system is up and operational. And next up, we have speed, how fast the system can go or how quickly you can get calm up. We have ancillary functions, switching, auxiliary channel performance monitors, and fault indicators. Let's take a look at the first two. Switching, used for redundancy. You guys have probably already experienced this when you have a more bad working piece of equipment and you remove and replace. There you go. Another part of that story is, is if you're in the wonderful world of computers and a server goes down, there's normally one right next to it that's going to take over the operation and the other one is going to let you know that, hey, I need help. Auxiliary channel. This one you're going to get to use when you get to the Jerk 239, better known as a tisser. What is it? Well, think of it as your whole job is to get that multiplexer's aggregate to the distant end. Well, if you happen to get onto one of those lines that the multiplexer is trying to do, you degregate the system. Well, what the Jerk 239 does for us is we're able to work on away from the mission traffic with our own channel. So maintenance, we're special, we get to have our own channel. That way we can troubleshoot the end-to-end -end transmission. We look at performance monitors, some fault indicators. Performance monitors, oh boy, you guys have come across that as well as fault indicators. So I'm lumping those two in the same one. Fault indicators, or excuse me, performance monitors, is if you took out your watt meter and you say, I need 10 watts out and I get five. That's nah, a problem, isn't it? You might want to start troubleshooting. That's a performance monitor. On the tisser, we have meters that will look at the voltages, it'll look at your receive signal level, it'll look at it test tones and just about anything else that you can imagine. We also have lights to tell us that whether we're working or we're not working. Uh, the bottom line is, is your visual comes into play big time with this in order to troubleshoot and fix items. Now, it took me a while when I first started troubleshooting, but the easiest way of doing troubleshooting is the visual. I know this kind of sounds wild, but whenever I had to go out and I had to troubleshoot a particular radio, the first thing I did is I didn't turn the lights on in the site. I left the lights off, and I scanned all those radios to see if I could either see, one, a light that was extinguished, or two, a red light that was on there. So that just gives you an idea of how you can look at the fault indicators with the performance monitors in being able to troubleshoot. The fault indicators do have uh, audible alarms on them, and I've had one, and I still remember it, and this is how I got about $1,000 in the uh, wonderful world of, what do you call them, suggestions, because our bell didn't work on the OJ314. They want us to get to the next highest assembly, which is about $1,300, and I said, all we need is a bell. We can go downtown and get it for 18 bucks. So I put in the suggestion and said, hey, why don't we just put a stock number for the bell? And lo and behold, I got $1,000 for making that suggestion. So it does work it's out there. So just a little tidbit for you. What's that, sir and Kenna? It's now the idea, not the suggestion program? Okay. Well, there you go. Idea program. Things change when you get out. So we've gone over basic radio uh, picture, fundamental parameters, radio performance assessment, and ancillary functions. Any questions over the information? I know it's a wealth of information, but is there anything that's, you know, they have a question on for now?
Guess not. All right, let's go to 3 Bravo. And identify basic facts and principles about capabilities, limitations, and motives. Anybody need a quick break? Go to the bathroom? By the way, if you really need to go, just put in chat, I need to go. Don't tell me where you need to go, just I need to go. And then I'll try to hold off because if there's something important and you have to go to the bathroom and you miss it, it could lead to some problems later. Also, this is recorded, so I'll be able to post it on YouTube as well as give you a copy of this so you can refresh your memory. So, identify basic facts about principles, capabilities, limitations, and modem. Everybody knows that you got to get 70% or better on the test to pass, preferably 80 or better. That means I got paperwork. If you don't, you got to get there is 40 questions on this test. Yes, 40. You got to answer 28 of them to pass, but I would prefer that you be in that uh, 30s to 40s in correct answers. Next up, we have the FSC application. Uh, you just can't get away from modems. You guys will be touching a modem whether you are in the Air Force or anywhere where you sit and, you know, as a home, so to speak. Why? Because you want the Internet. Can't get away from it. Everybody wants the Internet. Not really, but hey. We look at general modem principles, types of modulation, forward air correction, interleaving, traditional modems, and IP-based modems. Lovely stuff. First of all, we look at the definition. What the heck is a modem? Well, I like to equate it to one of the History Channel's uh, arguments with, I think it was Tesla and Edison, where you had one touting DC, the other one was AC. Now, DC was first out there lighting houses and things of that nature. The problem that they had is they couldn't build big enough generators to give DC to homes. But what happened is, is AC came online and was able to get it further than what DC could. So with modems, what they do is they take that digital intelligence and they modulate it. How do they modulate it? Well, the bottom line is we're going to take a digital signal and make it into an analog signal. That's what it does. You guys have dealt with this in the uh, PRIC 150 where you took your analog voice, converted it into PCM. Hmm, PCM. We've gone over that, haven't we? And we put it on an analog carrier to send it out over the airways. Now, are they working on digital signals that you can send out over the airway? Sure they are, but right now it's all analog. And you're going, well, they got digital TV. Au contraire. It's still analog. You can still use the same TV antenna, the rabbit ears, if you wanted to. And it won't make a difference. What makes a difference is how it gets demodulated to where you can view it. That's it. That's the reason why it went from analog to digital, because when the digital signal came in, it was able to shrink the amount of frequency space so they could get more frequencies out there for other providers. Uh, if you hadn't noticed, if you take a look throughout our frequency spectrum, there is a lot of usage on that spectrum. So when they try to look at it, they try to narrow those frequencies down to where they can add more. Same with modems. The idea is we don't want to broadcast a large amount, but at the same time we have to look at space versus what am I needing to send. That's the reason why we don't have a lot of fiber in places. At least not here anyway. You would think we would be the first, but no. My mom got it. It was in a rural area. She's had it for, oh geez, now going on five years, and I'm still waiting on fiber to get in this city. Amazing, isn't it? We have BOD. Now, this one, we're going to interchange the word BOD, and it can be symbol. 
symbol or bod, bod or symbol. Now, these modulation techniques that we're getting ready to go over, we're going to be looking at symbols and representing these modulation techniques. You can still use them as baud rate. Remember, bit rate and baud rate, completely different. Bit is a single digit. Baud, you're talking words here. So let's take a look at these things. We have three different types. We have frequency, amplitude, and phase. First up is frequency. It has a long history to it. And teletype of uh, anybody has ever heard of Diddy Bop, which is the Morse code. A lot of ham radio operators still use it out there today. Uh, I think I think it was Jay Leno on one of the nights had two uh ham radio operators who did Morse code, comparing it to two people who were doing texting. And in that scenario, the Morse code people, and he gave a paragraph to the guys that were going to text and a paragraph to the guys that were doing Morse code, and the Morse code beat them significantly in time. It was amazing. I don't think the guy even had a sentence made out and the Morse code guy takes one look and goes did it, did it, did it, did it, and the other guy's writing it all down and by that time it was done and over with by the time the guy got the first sentence out. Pretty amazing. Anyway, that's frequency shift keying. One bit per symbol. And you can see that when we look at the ones, it's one type of frequency and zeros are another type of frequency. You can pretty much say that this is NRZ to the fullest when you look at it. So when you compare the ones and the zeros, you can also compare the frequencies. Next up, we have amplitude shift keying. This one is going to vary the amplitude compared to the frequency. So frequency versus amplitude. Let's take a look at them. So the zeros are a small amplitude. The ones are a large amplitude. Pretty easy to understand. Then we get into phase shift keying. Wow. The first one, binary phase shift keying, BPSK versus quadrature phase shift keying, there is a difference between those. Let's take a look at binary. This one will shift the curve or the, the signal. Either, you know, if it's a logic one followed by a logic one, there is no shift. And same with a zero, there is no shift. But the moment it goes from a logic one to a zero or a zero to one, that's where it's going to shift. It is one bit per symbol or one baud per symbol or one baud, one bit per baud. There we go. BPSK, you can see that we have the... Good grief. That's what I get for pressing on those things. We get the ones until we get a shift in the zero. Once we get the shift in the zero, it changes on that zero line. That's binary phase shift keying. Again, one bit per symbol. It's when we get into quadrature that we start seeing more than one bit per symbol. In quadrature, we look at two bits. Now with QAM, they're starting to use QAM out there. I know that the HF or the ham radio operators do use QAM in sending packet data, and they've been quite successful at it. And the military is looking at that because they are considering that uh, HF and satellite, they they got to have a backup to it. So they're looking at HF to back up the satellite, and that's that we have adversaries that want to shoot our satellites out of the air when it comes right down to it. So we need to have a backup. And they're using this QAM, and the military is very interested in this. Quadrature can be three bits or more when you look at QAM. Excuse me, not quadrature. Yeah, quadrature is three bits. QAM is 10, or up to 10. So you can see that there is a difference between BPSK at one bit versus quadrature and QAM. So anything that you start dealing with more than two, 
because two means that you it's going to either be a one or a zero. So as same with uh, uh, FSK and FSK. There's always going to be it's either a one or a zero. When you get the quadrature, then you're going to look at it's uh, going to be a zero, 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 one. So you can see that's two bits. Or zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero. You can see that there becomes more data when you change just three bits versus if you imagine 10 bits. From what I understand, QAM is the precursor to the 4K, if not the 10K, that they're working on right now in Japan. TVs, that is. Next up, we have something called Ford Air Correction. The idea behind Ford, correct, Ford Air Correction is not sending a whole bunch of data and keep resending it and resending it and resending it. Because it ends up being a lot of equipment for that to happen. So what they do is they have something called Ford Air Correction. Now the object of this is, is we send a corrective bit down to the distant end and the distant end puts it together. I like to tell you that it is the equivalent of the electronics wheel of fortune. What do you mean? Well, remember at the, the end they always give you the vowels in one constant? Well, that's what's happening is they're sending it down the line, they're giving you all this information and you got to figure out how to put it all together and solve the puzzle. So with Ford Air Correction, depends everything to do with how many bits you're sending down. The first one where it says uh, one half. And what that means is I'm going to send you two pieces of data. The first one's going to be the intelligence. The second one is going to be the corrective error. The next one up, you have three quarters. That means I'm going to send you four pieces of data. Three are going to be the intelligence. The fourth one is the corrective bit. So forth for two thirds and five six and seven eighths. Next up, we have something called overall baud rate. There are three things you got to understand: baud rate, or excuse me, data rate the modulation type and forward air correction. You put those three together, you get a baud rate or symbol rate. Here is the slideshow that shows you that uh, the boxes that have data rate, you can see we got 512, 256, 128 into the one part. We have the forward air correction. Now this is all on the transmitter end that we're gonna send to the distant end. Remember if it gets to the distant end, and it has pieces missing, that's what that forward air correction is hopefully going to do. We take the forward air corrections numbers and the modulation type and we combine them all together. There is a mathematical way of doing it. We're not going to go through it. And then that's our baud rate or symbol rate. The distant end is going to take it and hopefully it's on the same time. Syncs it up, demods it and sends it out to the correct uh, correct channels or users that need it. So again, Ford Air Correction it generates the error bit at the transmitter, but it's put together at the distant end. Now, why in the world would you do that? Well, in our wonderful world right now, and I explain this through where I'm at, I don't have fiber. So I get, for example, it's raining outside. It's probably going to create some problems when I get on tonight to play my World of Tanks because my ping rate's going to be a little bit higher because it's going to be generating a lot of errors. And that's where that timing issues come into play. And because of those lines creating noise, you need to send those forward error corrections. That's the reason why we have it today. With fiber, it's a little bit less cumbersome because now you don't have to send as many forward air corrections as you would on a noisy line. And believe me, at Hill Air Force Base, they still have lines in the WSA that the moment it rains, oh geez, 
All of those wires are from the 1950s and they're paper wrapped. Hopefully by the time uh, you guys, if anybody goes there, they will have replaced all that wiring in there because it's a headache for transmitters and receivers. Why? Because that's where they use those lines to make the communications happen. All right, next up we have something called interleaving. This is a form of forward air correction. The idea is we're going to send a bunch of data down the line. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the idea behind interleaving, not interwoven or anything like that, but they mix it up within the uh, words there in, to prevent having the whole word being lost. So if we only have a bit of that word lost, then interleaving is another form in helping us out in getting the information we need to the distant end. We have traditional modem types. I can't tell you enough about the traditional modem. You probably heard it. Even YouTube has the sound on there, so if you want to have fun with it. We have a satellite modem. You guys probably saw it when you walked into 116 and didn't recognize it unless one of the instructors told you about it. It's off to the left if you were facing the three cases that you were working on for the NSM. Off to the left, there would look like a old-style TV with a bunch of cards in it. Well, there was no picture on there, but those cards are part of the iDirect that's connected to room 118 and 120. That's a satellite modem. Yeah, sure did. That's part of that iDirect. Next up, we have a fiber optic modem. There are five stages to it. The stages go in order of the way the signal is being sent out. These are high data rates. And again, I'm wishing I had it. You have a modulator in stage one. Stage two is a transmitter. Stage three is a receiver. And stage four is a demodulator. And of course, the last one everybody's familiar with because the last thing you want to do is take the time out and plug your wire into the wall. Well, I'm here to tell you that IP modems, yeah, that's great if you got a laptop, but when you're doing a desktop, it helps out significantly because it's a direct line to your router. You don't have to go through an IP modem, have to demodulate and wait on the router for a chance to get on. So it just goes to show you, hey, IP modems are good, except for nowadays what they have found out with the new, I think it's the A Alpha Charlie modems, slash routers, whatever you want to call them, that's out there. They got one that's called Alpha Charlie and Delta or new generation modems. And you're going, well, what does that got to do anything? Well, most of your modems or routers or what do you want to call it, the IP modems, they are, by nature, 2.5 or 5 gigahertz. Well, that's a problem if you have a two-story house and you don't centrally locate your IP modem. There are places in that house where you just can't get to. With the new generation uh router slash modem, what they do is they added a 60 megahertz line on there to get further in the house. It's slower throughput versus the other two, but at least you can now have the reaches. Why is that? Well, nowadays everything's being uh, home automated, you know, with Siri and whoever else is out there. What's the other one? Series one of them. Alexa, that's the Amazon one, right? I think. Okay, good. At least I wasn't, <coughs> excuse me, uh, dreaming there. Oh, wow. I know, I think 
hours on the building. They've installed a couple of wireless cameras in there, and they're having difficulties with that, trying to get it back in. Mm hmm Interesting. Well, I have wired cameras on all my house, so that way anytime I suspect something's happening outside, because with my Christmas lights, I don't take any chances. I, I have all my cameras on them because it can be very expensive to replace. So, yeah, I got 16 cameras. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, just go on YouTube. Pick one, and you're, that's probably mine. <laughs> I have uh, probably about, uh, last count I had was a little over 8,000. And they're pixels, and each strand of pixels is about 15 bucks. So you can imagine each one I can turn it in 256 different colors and sync it up to music. Because the cards that I need, i got to run data lines, i got to run power lines. You name it, I'm running it. And I got everything from legacy equipment all the way up to the new stuff. Uh, yeah, but I enjoy it. <laughs> What's that, Airman Javier? Well, they're not your original where they're just that incandescent lights. These, every individual light can light in 256 different colors. And I got them on the E's, I got them uh, on candy canes, I got them on uh, Christmas trees, I got them on, uh, I even have a snowflake tree that has these made up snowflakes that have 100 pixels each. The candy canes have about 99 pixels each. The E's are about, I don't know, about 400. Uh, you know, uh, not quite, <laughs> not quite. I try to keep it low key. <laughs> oh, there's houses out there that have a lot more than I do. But I like, I like the, you know, not less is better, but more the the happy medium would be a great way of saying it. So, okay, <laughs> enough of my Christmas lights. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have iDirect modems. This one just gives you an idea about what's happening on these iDirect modems. The biggest thing about the iDirect modem is it takes all of these different inputs and converts it either into the C band, the X band, the KU, and the KA band. Uh, Sergeant Young has come up with a pretty good ingenious way, but you can say that the KUKA band not to be confused with the K-pop band. Get it? K-pop? No? Bad. <laughs> anyway, it just gives you an idea how to remember the four different bands that are out there. It, I think the C band starts about 2.5 gig. And by the time you end up on the upper end of the KA band, it's around 40 gig. And this is all satellite communications. So now we've gone over general modem principles, types of modems, forward air correction, interleaving, traditional modems, IP-based modems. Are there any questions? No? Because I will be asking questions later on down the line uh, when we get into homework and appraisals. And when I get to the, uh, the tisser, I start asking you information that came from our backsides okay with ADT wow so get accustomed to when we get into the season D's of the tisser you're going to be starting to ask questions hey you remember this and then I'm going to ask a question of you know hey on the front panel of the tisser what are the you know what's the meter called that we talked about how did we uh, group that together you know, things like that. All right. Uh, I have 9.59. What we're going to do is we're going to take a 10-minute break and then cover the next set. All right? So be back at 10 after 10.
everybody ready? Griffin? I heard Caviar King? Price? Roundsley? Spore? Stanick? Hall? Green? And Alvarez? Rapoli? And Sergeant Cannon. Still getting his coffee. True NCO, going to be right on time. <laughs> I said you're a true NCO, you'll be right on time at 10.010, or 10.10. 10. <laughs> yeah, now you, you said you have that, was it Eero Hardware? That's the company, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Ooh. <laughs> and, and you get bennies on top of that if you're able to, right? Ooh. There you go. Mm-hmm. Roger that. I still remember one came to my house and went, he goes, yeah, we can put your cameras, we can put these sensors. And I said, you don't look very much, do you? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, take a look off to the corner of each part of my house here. And he just looked at me and went, never mind, and left. <laughs> yeah. And I told him, oh, and by the way, I do record audio. So what we say on the front porch but anything you record outside of your front porch area is a no-no. That's that's a state law here. So if somebody was say, selling drugs across the street and I recorded them, I wouldn't be able to use it, or they, they wouldn't be able to use it in the court of law. <clears throat> yeah, it's just one of those things. If you got your cameras pointed, try to point them in just the areas of your locale. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so we have everybody back. We have line of sight radio systems to go over. Line of sight principles, repeaters, limitations of repeaters. This is the line of sight for high gain antennas, not to be confused with line of sight when you're using omnidirectional antennas. With omnidirectional antennas, when you put up terrain, you have something called diffraction depending on your signals. With these type of antennas, if you get anything in between it, you're probably going to lose the signal. So they take this to heart when you're dealing with those highly directional signals with this type of equipment. Well, they use something called tropospheric scatter, which are getting ready to use it, but with the tissers, you get anything in between those antennas, you run the risk of not being able to communicate. But that's more short range versus the tropo, which is a longer range. This is the reason why they look at, you know, when we talk uh, electrically coupling and things of that nature to the earth with our signals, we're going to see this in this first chart here, which leads me to this one. In your files, you should have the electronic C's and D's. This is page one, and unfortunately, there's nothing below this one like it is on your C's and D's. And it will show you that radio horizon extends farther than optical horizon. So you can see true horizon versus optical. But when you get to radio horizon and compare it to true horizon, it's 33% more. That is on your C's and D's. It's below what we can show you right here. I don't know why they didn't include it. It would have made sense to do so. 
So just uh, go ahead. Yes. Makes life a lot easier when you're looking at it too. Again, those are provided for you on the, the CD that you get. And you also have a paper copy in the testing room. I opt out for the paper copy because it's so much easier to read. Hard to see on a very small computer screen. That's the reason why I got 24-inch monitors. I'd go bigger, but too expensive. Okay, so everybody got that. Understand where to find this particular item. Sergeant Kenner provided you the information for it. Next up, we have typical line of sight. Typical. And this is at 20 to 50 miles, 3 to 50 gig, 1 to 5 watts. This is what we're dealing with when we look at something that's a wideband piece of equipment. You're dealing with satellites. It's a different story. It's all going to change. But line of sight, we're talking here on the Earth, uh, being able to go that distance. Uh, I don't know if anybody's actually gone out White Avenue Gate, and when they came out, they noticed that they thought they could see a bunch of trees way out there. Well, that's Cat Island, and yes, you can see it on a pretty decent clear day. That's about 14 miles out, and you can get radio communications out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Practical application for line of sight radios. Biggest thing is, is the last thing you want to do is dig a ditch for your cables. So what we do is we use this wideband equipment to, sh to multiplex, put it in that equipment, and send it to the distant end. That prevents us from having to get out our tools and for about 10 to 15 days having to dig, dig like four or five miles. That's ridiculous. So by using a radio like this, we're able to get distance. Terrain is another one. If you can't dig in rock, you know, that's another reason why you don't want to, you know, wh why you would use one of these items. Now, we also have something called repeaters. Now, for example, we just told you 20 to 50 miles. Let's say that you want to go further. Well, when you have more equipment, you can go further. You can use these repeaters. And again, that's in your C's and D's of what we're going to be looking at. Repeaters are, and you've seen this in Block 5, transmitter and a receiver put together, and they are normally full duplex. They got to do two functions though. One is called frequency translation, or as I like to call it, frequency conversion. We're going to convert the receive frequency into a different transmit frequency so we don't interfere with each other. The next one is, is obviously when we receive it, it's going to be a pretty weak signal to begin with, so we have to amplify it to send it out to go further. That's the reason why we have repeaters to get more distance and to defeat some of the terrain features. For example, obviously, you know, if you're in the valley, you're, you're trying to reach the next, let's say, an outpost that's on the opposite side of that, well, <laughs> unless you have a repeater, you're probably not going to be able to talk. And using SATCOM, no, probably not going to happen. There's four different types of repeaters. Again, this is all on your C's and D's. There's an RF repeater, an IF repeater, a baseband repeater, and the audio repeater. Now, the last two are not on there, but only on the slideshows in generality. So we only cover the RF repeater and IF repeater on the C's and D's. We're just letting you know that, hey, baseband and audio is not on there. So this is your first one. It should be on page two of those C's and D's. It is the RF repeater and you can see we have frequency conversion and amplification. So as you can see from the left hand side you have 400 
excuse me, 4,400 megahertz. It comes in and it amplifies it. Why does it amplify it? Well, it's a weak signal to begin with. Then we're going to take the little local oscillator, mix it in there, and in this case we're going to increase it by 260 megahertz to get us to 4,660 megahertz. And again, we're going to amplify it enough to where we can send it to the distant end. You'll notice that the transmit, uh, transmit frequency does not or is not the same as the receive frequency. So one, we have amplification and two, we have frequency translation or frequency conversion, however you want to say that. The problem with the RF, anytime that you amplify and let's let's go back to that front end of the receiver. When you amplify, yeah, you're able to take out some of the noise, but internally, anytime you amplify, it generates noise also with the particular components because you're amplifying. There's really no way to truly take out all of the noise in one step with this RF amplification. Next up, we have the IF repeater. The difference between the RF and the IF is we're going to break the signal down even further. Instead of just converting it from one frequency to another, we're going to break it down to an IF frequency of 70 megahertz. We're going to be able to clean it up a little bit more than what we could with the RF repeater. Again, you can see we start out with 4,400 megahertz. We're going to amplify it, go through a down converter. And of course, this all comes with filters in there. And we're going to go down convert it to 70 megahertz. We're going to amplify it a little bit more. Send the 70 megahertz up to the up converter. And again, the local oscillator is going to help us out. We're going to add 200 and, what was it, 200 and, 60 megahertz to get us to 4,660 4, megahertz and then we're going to amplify it to what we need it to do to send to the distant end. When you compare the two, the RF versus the IF, the IF has less distortion because it's breaking it down and cleaning it up as it's doing it. The baseband repeater is a little bit different. This is what a tisser can do. By, and this was back in, I want to say about 2010, we were able to, on nights, grab the Block 10's equipment, take it outside, and we would set up a multiplexer that had a phone on it, because we had the particular card, put it into the tisser, tisser would shoot it across, or th they would set this up at Foster's, shoot it across the triangle there to the Levitol building and we would have a repeater there. We would have two tissers that would have coming out of the baseband assembly going into the other baseband assembly and shooting it to the edge of Jones Hall. Jones Hall would take it out of the tisser, which was the baseband signal, tie it to the satellite in room 120 send it up to the sat sim, bring it back down, and then they had a multiplexer on the back side of it, and they were able to talk to each other from inside Jones Hall to Foster's by using that repeater. It's probably the most simplistic design, and it can break it down. The nice thing about this is, is if we wanted to, right around where that repeater is, we would literally have to run it through a multiplexer, excuse me, <coughs> and we could pull uh, signals out or put more signals in and put it back into the baseband and send it out to the other side of that repeater and vice versa. So you could actually put some drops in there to where you could, let's just say that you had at that site a repeater and you had to be a different post, which is a listening post, and it's sending it to the op uh, observation post. So those you can mix and match those signals that's the nice thing about a baseband repeater and it's better than the RF or the IF why because you're breaking it down even further and the last one is the audio repeater 
this one is the most expensive, but remember when we talked about frequency response and fidelity and all that? This is where it breaks it down to the original signal as best as it could, the representation of it. So if you needed to insert signals, you could, but it is, like it says, it's very expensive. So the limitations of repeaters. First of all, what is its capabilities? Capabilities of the equipment. If your repeater only goes 10 miles, then you can go, by putting a repeater in two different areas, you can go 20 miles. Equipment capability. Again, if you only have 10 miles to cover, that's great. If you got 20 miles to cover, okay, add the, the repeaters in. The problem is, is if you need to go 50 miles, well, your equipment doesn't do it. So it would, that would be a limitation. Terrain. Well, I need to go 50 miles and my tissues only does 20 miles because of the dish. I can't get up and over the mountaintops. Okay, there's a problem. That's a limitation of a repeater. And lastly, if I need to go 50 miles for a communication network, do I really need to go to that 50 miles or is it a nicety? And some of these places, like in Afghanistan, where they have listening and observation posts, it's a very bare bones system and they're probably shooting a signal to them, but they're not going to be playing games on it. So the question is, is it for information that needs to get from you know, when you're in a listening or observation post and getting it back to your command post is, okay, we got activity over here, okay? Is that a need of the network? I would probably say yes. But if you just need it because, oh, the guys, you know, for morale and blah, 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 well, okay, can we afford to do that? That would be a nicety. So depending on the needs of the network, the distance it's got to go, the equipment capability and terrain, that's all limitations of the repeaters. Noise factor, you can read it. Frequency, you only have eight links before you got problems with noise. And what does it mean? Well, with the baseband signal, if you incorporate noise on a digital signal, that computer or whatever it is on the distant end may not be able to decipher what it is. And forward error correction is not going to help it. Same with uh, TDM. 15 consecutive links, okay. That's, that's limitations. So we looked at line of sight principles, repeaters, limitations of the repeaters. Any questions? Seems pretty straightforward, right? Go ahead, sir. Let's see. Yep, here he goes. It says, look at the bottom sentence of that slide. It says, largest amount of distortion when it comes to the RF repeater. When you go to the IF repeater, less distortion. Distortion being noise. Mm-hmm, exactly. Any other questions? That was a good one. In the IF, okay, you see the 70 megahertz? That's what it breaks it down to. Yeah. We have frequency conversion. How does the IF do it compared to the RF? Well, RF, you're still converting RF. This one breaks it down to the IF section. Anytime that you break a signal down, you're actually cleaning it up before it gets amplified. With the RF, it's not going to have as much filtering to get rid of the distortion as it does with the IF. And again, when you get to the baseband, there's a lot more cleaning up of the signal when it finally gets down to the baseband side before it gets reamplified and sent out or up converted. With 
radios, the idea is we want to get it as clean of a signal as possible so when it hits your handset or headset, you're able to hear it clearly with little to no distortion. That answer your question there? You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. Okay, we're going to stop right there. I got 1029. Uh, the reason I'm going to stop here is I got two more items we need to go over for the 1 o'clock, and we can start in tomorrow morning at 9, starting on the, hopefully, the, the signal flow diagram. So I'm going to reserve today, this afternoon, for 4, four Alpha and 4 Bravo. And then part of for Charlie, if I get to it, and then tomorrow morning we're going to be going through signal flow. Any questions? All right, we'll see you at the 1 o'clock session then. We'll see you then. Have a nice lunch. All right.